for RSK 403, the main thing that the lecturer emphasizes is that when you're answering the questions in the exam, you need to show a high level of understanding of the concepts that you've gone through in the, uh, within the different study units as well. And what you also need to take note of is that um, we already have a catalog of the articles that are relevant for all the study units. And what we have done is that if you have noticed, uh, I'm sure that everyone is, now has the um, articles relevant for study unit one. And uh, well, I'm also going to post the articles for study unit uh, two, the ones that are going to be covering in the next class as well, so that those who are not registered they won't be disadvantaged, they will still be able to access those articles as well. But under normal circumstances, once you are registered, you're able to access the full catalog of our, of the different study units as well. Now, if you look at the study units, uh, at the different articles as well, you will see that um, there is, it's an independent person who has prepared the article, which means that you now need to make sure that when you're going through the different articles, you need to be able to address the issues that are stated under, um, under the section self-assessment, right? So if you check what needs to be addressed under self-assessment, those are the issues that you would expect to be um, uh, the type of question that the lecturer, lecturer or uh, issues that the lecturer would uh, expect you to address or to pick out from the article that is going to be, uh, that is given there as well. <coughs> now, if you look at study unit one, study unit one has um, sections 1.1 to 1.6. So study unit one has section 1.1 to 1.6. And study unit one mainly looks at uh, lessons not learned where you look at the situations where there was um, uh, risk management failures, there was also issues and the reasons why the risk management basically failed as well. And why in some cases you find that there are other companies that have gone through the same thing and it, which basically means that there are lessons not learned if, as though mainly because some of the uh, issues that have happened so many years ago keep coming back as well. If you look at study unit one, please take note, section 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. These sections, they cover uh, case studies of, um, or case studies of companies where there was risk management issues and all other issues as well, right? So which means, they are basically discussing uh, historical case studies where the, the, there was uh, risk management failures. And then they also delve into the history of exactly what really led on to the uh, risk, different risk management failures as well. So you see that going to the exam, section 1.1 to 1.5, don't expect them to be highly examinable. So going to the exam, section 1.1, and 1.5, up to 1.5, don't expect them to be highly examinable because it's just giving you, uh, to 1.4, sorry, it's just giving you um, case studies of situations where, um, where risk management failed as well. In the exam, they will, if they give you a case study, they'll give you information about a particular company, then you are now expected to actually deduce and analyze that company in and applying the things that you have learned as well. So we don't expect you to, uh, they are not expecting you to know in detail uh, what happened to the company and, all, and so forth and so forth. It's just for you to be able to give a general understanding of the reasons why risk management failed as well. <coughs> now, if you look at section 1.1, so, if you look at section 1.1, if you look at section 1.1, we saw which means, or oh, before I even go there, so please take note that there are, uh, there are six topics that are going to be covered for RSK 403. 
So there are six topics which are going to be covered for RSK 403. But you see that as we go on to um, topic five, there are some sections which the lecturer deems not to be highly examinable. But by the time we get to topic five, it will be clear on exactly whether the lecturer is expecting to know certain sections as well. Because in topic five, there are certain sections which are expected to be just known as general knowledge, but not something that is examinable. Then there are certain sections that the lecturer emphasizes for the exam as well. So you will see that topic five is not everything in topic five that are going to be covered because it's not everything that is going to be deemed relevant for the exam as well. So in topic one, you uh, this is where so topic one covers study units one, two, and three. So to topic one covers study units one, two, and three. And today we are going to look at study unit one. Then in the next class we are going to look at study unit two. But in most cases study unit two we usually split it into two different classes mainly because it's there, the articles are quite long and they are also highly examinable as well. So which means that for, for topic two, uh, for sorry, but for study unit two, we usually split it into, uh, to, to, into two classes. So expect that, so which means that I'm going to give you, when I send you the articles, I'm also going to bear that in mind that it's not everything that I'm going to be sending you that's going to be what covered in that particular class as well. Then we we'll look at study unit three, and on, on and on and on, but we'll discuss those study units as we go as well, right? So please take note, today we're going to bring in study unit one, right? So before I delve into study unit one, is there any questions? So before I delve into study unit one, is there any questions or anything, or someone who's struggling to access the material or anything before you actually delve into study unit one? Um, Rhymes. Yes. I just want to check. So the study unit one, do we get it on the Mayonisa? Oh, you Mayonisa. mean the, the different uh, study units? Yes. Yes, you get them under Mayonisa. Um, you know what? Let me just quickly share it now in class so that you're able to, uh, to so that you are able to have it. But you you get it under Mayonisa. And um, so you get it under Mayonisa. And when it comes to the study guide as well, avoid using the study guide from the previous years or if someone has given you material from the previous years as well mainly because there are certain things that the lecturer has updated there are certain mistakes that were in the study guide that the lecturer actually updated as well so please make sure that you get the latest study guide that is meant for you guys then uh then also uh yeah just make sure that you get the study guide and remember there are some sections or some study units where we are going to be looking, the way we are going to find the material in the study guide as well. So please make sure that you bear that in mind that you always have to make sure that you have the study guide with you so that whenever you're going, going through the different study units, you have the study guide should guide you, especially when it comes to addressing these issues under self-assessment as well. Is there any other questions? Um, are you guys able to hear me clearly? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Yes, you okay. can. Oh yeah, the other thing as well is, please make sure that where you are seated, you have a good network connection. So make sure that where you are seated, you have a good network connection. Because if you don't have a good network connection, you see that it you struggle to actually uh, see the visuals or to see the videos as well to, to see to hear when I'm uh, when I'm discussing in class as well so make sure that you have a good network connection and you because if you have a good network connection you should it means that even uh, when it comes to me demonstrating things on the board it should be clearer for you it should you should not have issues uh seeing the things that I'm going to be demonstrating on the board as well so please make sure that where you are seated you have a good network connection because on my side, I have another device that I use to actually check to see if everything is in order, if there's a loss in connection or anything like that as well. So please make sure that you have a good network connection. Is there any other questions? Uh, yes, Reynolds, Tim Singer, GM. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to know, just before we, we fly off, the, mm -hmm. the tools that we're going to need for this module, uh, the textbooks, uh, calculators, if any, and all those things. Can you just clarify all those things that we're going to need? Um, remember for this module, since 2018, they did away with the textbook. There was a textbook that was being used previously, but since 2018, they did away with the textbook, which means that your curriculum is based on the articles. But now to know which articles are relevant, you have to go check in the study guide. Because remember, even when we're going to go through the curriculum together as well, we always refer back to the study guide because the study guide is gonna give us to say, this particular study unit, this is what you need to, uh, these are the articles that are relevant and these are the, um, so this is what you need to make sure that you address in those articles as well, under self-assessment. So there's no particular textbook, but you, you need to be having the relevant articles for each study unit as well. So that's what you need for um, uh, for the for, for the uh, for when you're going to the curriculum. Then um, the calculator for um, RSK point zero three is a normal scientific calculator. Uh, a normal scientific calculator will suffice. So in just a normal scientific calculator, we are able to add and subtract and do all the other basic calculations there. It should be uh, enough for you to actually go through the, the material as well. Because you see that the calculations that are going to be doing later on as well, it's not complex calculations, but it's just uh, calculations where you are basically adding to see, for example, when you're calculating the cost of risk, it's basically identifying the different components and also then adding up to see exactly what the total cost of risk would be. We'll do that later on, but it's simple calculation. So it means that for RISK 403, you are, we are not expecting you to have uh, a, finan a financial calculator per se. I, I wouldn't say just a normal scientific calculator would do. Then when it comes to um, the revision, uh, we have, uh, the database of uh, the question, past question papers, we have them all until January this year as well. So which means that you don't have to worry about being able to access that. When we approach revision, we'll make them available to you guys so that you're able to access the past paper questions as well. And we already have the past paper memos. Yeah, the only one that we just need to compile is the one for Jan, February 2021. Otherwise, the other past papers, they are there already. So which means that you don't have to worry about the memos for those past papers as well. So when we, but we'll deal with that as we approach revision. Okay. Then, then when also, um, remember all our sessions are recorded. So which means that uh, within a week, uh, after we have every session, we edit the video, and we post it so that we make it available under your user account as well. So that in case you missed the class or something happened, or there's something that you missed in the class as well, or something that you didn't understand, you can still go back to it and also uh, have a look at it to see exactly uh, what is it that you missed. And also please take note that um, we also may, uh, you, if you book, you can also book for an online consultation so that in case there's something that you still not understanding in the textbook, we can also be able to make um, time to actually address those issues that you might have if there's a need for us to actually have uh, an online consultation as well, depending on exactly how much needs to be addressed there. Okay. Hi, it's Q here. I have a question. Um, is it true that we'll be writing these modules in September? Because I see uh, my UNISA doesn't have anything for the exam timetable. <laughs> Do you know if it's true so that we can plan ahead and... Okay, please take note. Mm. Your curriculum, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult, very, very difficult for us, for you to have gone through everything by end of September. Okay. So 
I am not expecting them to change the timetable for, for the, for the postgraduate students. So okay. this timetable that you are hearing, or that the exams will be right, written in September, October, November. So please take note that deal, um, deal with them as issues for undergrads. For postgrads, I don't really expect them to change the exam timetable from the Jan Feb next year. Okay. They, I, don't, I wouldn't really expect them to change that timetable. Even on yeah. our planning, we are. I, I, I'm not expecting them to change that timetable because it's it's. If you are going to write an exam in September on let's say November, it means you have compressed your curriculum and you have left out November, December, January, February as well. Oh, let's say January. Because the exams yeah. this year were written end of January, mostly uh, just until mid or mid of February as well. So it means mm. that you would have lost three months of your time to actually prepare for exam or four months of your time to actually prepare for, prepare for the exam, which I don't think that's why I'm saying I don't think that the exams would you should expect your exams to be written in um ex or September, October, or whatever that period is. I it's it's I don't think it's practical. So okay. Just do, your timetable should just be based on you writing your exam. January. The earliest that you write your exam is going to be end of January next year. Okay, thanks. Right. Are there any other questions? All right, so let's look at study unit one. And remember, like what I said, study unit one, there are certain sections that I'm just, I'm just going to highlight to you, but I don't deem them to be highly examinable, mainly because it's just case studies where there was risk management failure. So you just need to go over those sections so that you just have a rough understanding, but otherwise, so that in practice, you know exactly that this is what's happening with this company and this is what's happening with the, this is what happened historically with this company as well, but don't expect it to be something that is going to be Exact that that you should see as examinable as well, because it, under all circumstances, if they're going to give you ask you questions regarding a, a case of a particular company, they will give you information that you need to answer that particular question in the exam as well. So it's not it's not like you're expected to know to have um know in detail the general knowledge, but you can use the general knowledge now to actually use an exam as an example to explain a particular concept on a question that you'll be as this so you can do that so that you show that you are answering the questions at a higher level than what than just an undergrad student as well so um for under topic one so they give us the learning outcomes in topic one but the learning outcomes that are going to be interested in for studying it one is going to be uh these three so these are the learning outcomes were expected to know from uh, study unit one then if you check study unit one it looks at um lessons not learned and um under overview so if you check under overview they say we begin this module by trying to understand why apparently well-managed enterprises ran in to serious financial problems and while in some of them were able to recover others were not so fortunate although we mostly use examples of international enterprises the principles remain the same irrespective uh where the enterprise resides we refer to newspaper articles about state-owned enterprises in south africa but it, as these are still disasters in the making we cannot include the reports in the final outcome of our investigation there are parallels between the uh, underlying causes of the demise of private enterprises and uh and soes however the re the action or reaction to corporate failures is normally brutal and swift in contrast the eventual losses of soes in south africa are pounded off to the taxpayer to the taxpayer which is an a, a euphemism for an effect stealing, uh, stealing from the poorest of the poor to uh, or as funds that could have been utilized for, for, for example, the upliftment of communities, improved health services uh, or education are now used to enrich politically well-connected families or to bail out inefficient 
uh, entities as well. So the next that we need to introduce the concept of enterprise risk management. The other modules are in this qualification covered the covered the risk types such as operational credit uh, market risk. But as the as this module is focused on the financing of enterprises, uh, enterprise risks, it is important to have a deeper understanding of how the enterprise is governed, capitalized, and financed pre-loss and post-loss events. The risk appetite of the enterprise is also important as it will eventually drive the outcomes of decisions. The last study unit in this topic covers the concept of capital risk and capital and uh, capital uh, uh, the, of the concept of capital, risk capital, and capital budgeting. The underlying principle is that the, uh, that capital is not a free good and is uh, uh, and in unlimited supply. So it is therefore important for the enterprise to have a good understanding of its cost of capital to determine which projects to accept or reject. So again, the risk appetite is a very good uh, is a very good understanding of the risk of the enterprise uh, are critical in the process of the enterprise needs to optimize spending, and that is the most bang uh, for their buck as well. So now, which means when we look at risk financing when we look at risk financing whenever you are addressing issues on risk financing you must always make sure that you go back to the principles that you have learned at undergrad level where we say what is the goal of the firm the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders wealth right so the goal of the firm is to maximize shareholders' wealth, which means for you to maximize shareholders' wealth, how do you see now that you've managed to maximize shareholders' wealth? So you are, you are able to see that you've maximized shareholders' wealth by maximizing the value of the company. So if they say the enterprise or company or the firm, you should know they're talking about one and the same thing. So the goal of the firm is to maximize the shareholders' wealth, and you are, this is able to be achieved through maximizing what? the value of the firm as well. So how do we get this value of the firm? We know that the value of the firm is a, given as your assets is equal to equity plus liabilities. So if you go back to the accounting equation, your assets is equal to equity plus liabilities. What do we see? What makes up your equity? Your equity is made up of your ordinary shares and your equity is made up of your retained earnings. Then there is also a hybrid between equity and liabilities, which is the preference share, preference shares. Then there's also the liabilities, where with the liabilities, you are mainly looking at the main liabilities being your, your uh, loans. So we typically look at your liabilities being typically your loans and, and uh, uh, bonds. And then there's also other type of liabilities but the ones that are going to be mostly interested in there is the loans and the bonds as well. So it can be short-term loans, long-term loans, and then there's also the bonds as well, right? But there are other liabilities that are also of interest as well. So this is all, so which means that to finance these assets of the firm, the assets of the business, they are financed either through equity, the different uh, uh, forms of equity, or through the different forms of what? Of liability. And remember, the preference shares, they, they are more like, they are purely equity and they are purely liabilities. They are more like a hybrid between equity and liability because they carry the characteristics of equity and liabilities as well. So which means this value of the assets is what we deem to be the firm value. So this is the firm value. So which means now in financing these assets, these different contributors so these different contributors are going to be taking there's risk involved in financing this uh these assets as well so when you look at risk financing you're now trying to take into account to see exactly so what are the different forms of risk that is uh that is actually taken in trying to finance the assets of the business with, with the goal being to what maximize what the value of the firm. What do we also know? We know that these different contributors 
towards financing the assets of the business. Their aim is to ensure that they are able to minimize the risk for a given level of return. Remember, there's always a relationship between risk and return. Remember, the higher the risk, the higher the expected return. So the higher the risk, the higher the expected return. But now when these contributors of uh, capital towards the assets as well, they, they, whenever they take risk, they know they, should, they are also going to be uh, uh, expecting what more returns as well. Now, what do we see? It basically means that at the end of the day, if they, for them to be saying that they are happy with their contributions towards the assets of the business so that they, they are able to what, finance the business as well, it basically means that they want to be able to maximize the return for a given level of risk. And at the same time, they want to be able to minimize the risk for a given level of what? Of return. So that's their aim. So which means that this is how they are able to make sure that they're able to maximize what utility from their what? From their investment as well. Now, when it comes to risk financing as well, we're going to look at this later on in our study unit three, which is also under topic one as well, that there is another component to this financing of the business. So there's another component to this financing of the business. Apart from equity and liabilities, there's another component to this financing of the business, which is basically uh, what we call risk capital. So we call this risk capital, but we'll discuss this later on in start unit three. So you should know that there's also another component that is also part and parcel of the financing of the uh, of the enterprise as well. So there's another component that is also part and parcel of the financing of the enterprise. So now, but in short, this component is basically when we look at uh, uh, insurance as a form of what? Financing of the enterprise as well. So insurance also forms part of financing of the enterprise, but we'll discuss it later on. So now it means all these different players or contributors to the assets of the business, wherever they contribute, they are also going to be taking on risk. So there's risk involved as well. So which means the reason why we are very much concerned about um, um, risk management failures uh, or in the different case studies that are going to be looking at is mainly because if, they, if there's a risk management failure, what is going to happen? It means that risk is going to now is now going to get out of hand for a given level of return that the contributors of what of the financing of the business have made as well. Because remember, at the end of the day, you need to make sure that you minimize your risk as much as possible for an expected return that these contributors of what of fi of the uh, financing of the business are are contributing. But now, the moment there's a risk management failure, what is going to happen? It basically means that the risk is not going to get up out of hand. There's going to be too much risk, and that failure to manage the risk is what usually resulted in the in the what um in some of the companies being closed down or some of the companies do what running bankrupt becoming bankrupt as well so is there any question regarding the risk financing uh how it links with the accounting equation before we go on to unit 1.1 Now, unit 1.1, unit 1.1 also looks at the case study of uh, ESCOM. So unit 1.1 looks at the case study of ESCOM of uh, where there are different issues that uh, came up when it comes to unit 1.1 as well. So please take note. My advice would be, if you look at the case study of ESCO, you will see that the first case is the financial um, full financial report for 2017 for ESCOM. And it's about 48 pages. The second one, 
is the ESCOM uh, inquiry, the reference book, and it's about 26 pages. I'm not going to delve into it now in class, but what I'm going to do is just discuss it briefly, but I'm not going to delve too much in class, mainly because our approach is very much exam focused type of approach as well, so that we approach on things that we know that you need to be able to take note of when you're preparing for the exam. In practice, you need to know exactly what, what is happening at ESCOM so that you're able to now know exactly where the different risk management failures also came about as well. So when it comes to this case study of ESCOM, I'm not going to delve too much into it. Um, but one thing that you that is mainly highlighted when it comes to the case study of ESCOM is that um, the, the, the risk management failures at ESCOM mainly came about mainly because there was uh, a lot of what lack of accountability and lack of transparency in some of the activities that ESCOM has come about has been uh, the way ESCOM has been doing business as well. And because of that, this is where you see that now there's a lot of influ political influence in ESCOM. It basically meant that um, the company always is always seeking billions and billions in bailouts. But if you now look at the different, uh, if you look at the inquiries as well, you see that there's a lot of proofage when it comes to uh, ESCOM, where there's a lot of uh, fraud happening, there's a lot of accusations of fraud, there's a lot of uh, uh, money that is that is also being lost out because of lack of what delivery of some of the services that have been not rendered to ESCOM as well. So I'm not going to delve too much into ESCOM mainly because. I really don't see it being something that the lecturer is going to bring about as a section which is highly examinable. Then. Is there any any question on uh, on anything that you'd want to ask when it comes to Unit One Point One? Because for me, I really don't see it as something that is highly examinable. So, yes, they give you so many pages of uh, what you need to go through, but I really don't think that you should spend a lot of, of your time going through the case study of ESCOM. Know the basics of exactly what are the issues involved in ESCOM, but I don't, don't dwell too much of your time going through the 48 pages of the report and the other 26 pages as well. Just know the basics and move on because it's not something that I would say is highly examinable. In practice, yes, you need to know where, where, ESCOM, is, uh, is getting, uh, where ESCOM is getting it wrong, but for the sake of the exam, I really don't think that you should swell, spend a lot of your time going through the different pages of the case study there. Is there any question? Yeah, so that I know, uh, in terms of the assignment, uh, you don't think uh, this, uh, there, there might be questions from uh, ESCOM uh, case studies? We have done this over the years, even since they have asked, uh, they've changed the curriculum, we have done the assignments so many times, it has never come about. So just go through it, but don't spend too much of, of your time on it. Remember your assignments, you are going to, okay, let me just quickly discuss the assignments as well. You are going to expect six assignments. So you, unless the lecturer changes, expect six assignments, right? Now, of the six assignments, so there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's, these are the six assignments that, um, that you should expect. Please, please take note, assignments one, two, three, and five, usually there are short questions based type of assignments. Usually you answer these assignments online. So don't, and they carry less weight contributing towards your five, your, your year mark as well. So assignments one, two, three, and five, they carry less weight when it comes to contributing towards your, what? your year mark. But now, Assignment four and assignment six. These are the two where you, you are having 
a structured type of assignment. And these are the ones that usually carry a lot of weight towards your assignment. Because in most cases, they either give you a particular case study and then you are expected to answer it, or they sometimes even give you a long, uh, long, uh, long, long, um, like it, is a, it becomes a long question where it, they can ask you a particular to discuss a certain concept and then they say, uh, they give you 10 marks or 15 marks or 25 marks or 20 marks as well, right? So assignment four and assignment six are the ones where you are, which are going to be carrying a lot of weight. And these assignments, if they give you a case study, they'll give you the case study. And from the case study, they will expect you to answer questions and analyze the company based on the case study, depending on exactly what they want you to address. But assignment four and assignment six, if they give you as a case study, they'll give you information on the case study and you answer questions based on the case study. And remember what I told you, if they give you a case study, they give you the information and then you're expected what? To answer questions based on that as well. So that's assignment four and six. Assignment one, two, three, and five, they are usually short questions type of, uh, they are usually short, um, short questions where they, from the different uh, articles or studies that, 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 uh, that they would have, that they would have, that they expect you to have gone through, they will now ask you like a theory question based on that, or sometimes they ask you a true or false question as well. But remember, it's gonna be, it, it will be a lot of questions. Like for example, they'll make it out of 30 or out of 25 or what, out of whatever, but then it will be a lot of what? Short questions that they would be expecting to answer as well. And there's also, I can't remember whether it's assignment one or assignment two, where there is, if you check on the information that the lecturer would have given you, they, would, they should have given you, um, an extract of GSC 26, um, GSC 26. Mm. They would have given you an extract of GSC 26.0. Let me just quickly check which. Uh, 26.02. They will give you an extract of GSC 26.02, right? This additional results of GSC 2602, you need it to answer one of the assignments as well. But please take note, it's preparing you to know the statistical concepts that, uh, the, it's basically preparing you to know the statistical concepts, but this, you cannot, don't expect them to ask you those statistical concepts in the exam. I've never seen it happen, never ever. I've never seen the concepts that they are addressing GSC 2602 being asked in the exam. If they do bring them, it's simplified kind of questions, like simplified kind of concepts as well, not deep statistical type of what concepts that they bring you. So this, yes, for the assignment, you need it, but don't dwell too much of your time on this one, mainly because Yes, you need to answer the assignments, but don't expect this to be asked in the exam. Don't expect that to be started that way. Because in most cases in the exam, they'll ask you uh, a lot of concepts, but not necessarily to, for you to be able to now know in, in detail the detailed uh, statistical concepts that are covered in this 2602 as well. Yes, for the assignment, yes, they would expect you to know, but when it comes to the exam, so don't, spend a lot of your time going through this because you'll be wasting your time. So what I'll do is, if this concept do, do come, I'll assist you and show you exactly how they are getting the answers. But when it comes to, so that you don't dwell a lot of your time going through this concept, because this is not how they will ask you questions in the exam as well. Are there any questions? So, yes, the case of ESCOM, case, the, the case of ESCOM is there. 
brush through it, but don't spend a lot of your time going through it. Because if they give you, that's why I was saying that start unit 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1.4. Know the cases where there's a risk management failures and those uh, those examples as well of these companies that have actually failed. But at the end of the day, don't dwell or spend a lot of your time going through these concepts as well. Through going to the, the case studies. Yes, know that they are there and this is what really happened with the, with the companies, but don't dwell too much of your time, mainly because when it comes to the exam, if you want to be exam focused, it means that you'll be spending, eating a lot of your, of your time into something that we know that is not something that is highly examinable at the end of the day. Are there any questions? So, so Rhinos, maybe the last one here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that you more focus on uh, exam things and so forth. Are you going to deal with those, the basic things that deals with risk financing as well? You mean when it comes to the, the different case studies? Yes, the approach in terms of the entire uh, learning uh, thing, material. Oh, yes, yes. You see, unit 1.1 to 1 1.4, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because uh, I don't see those sections being highly examinable. But when it comes to uh, the other study units, we are going to go in depth with them and have a deeper understanding, mainly because that this is where I would expect that the exam focus is going to be based on. Because in most cases, especially when you look at um, study unit two, Study unit two forms the foundation of a lot of theory questions that the lecturer asks you in the exam. So yes, the, they can give you a particular case and then they ask you to answer the question on a particular case, but you need to use the material from study unit two now to understand it in detail so that when you're answering questions on a particular case, you're going to be able to actually refer to the material that you've planned. So for, to be honest with you, over these years, Study unit one, there is nothing that is ever, that I would remember being asked coming from study unit one. But study unit two, highly examinable. Study unit two onwards, those concepts that are covered there, we are going to go in depth with them, mainly because this is where we are saying that this is the crux of where the lecturer you always pick out concepts to ask in the exam. But for study unit one, I, I really don't, expect much to be coming from study unit to one when it comes to the exam as well. Study, study unit 1.2. So study unit 1.2 uh, looks at the case of uh, Nick Leeson, and he was, um, he was a directional trader at uh, uh, Berlin's bank, and he was dealing with the Nikkei um, futures as well. So the crux of the matter when it comes to uh, Nick Leeson, if you just check at the beginning here, they say, the collapse of Bering's bank has a large, uh, to a large extent became the benchmark for bank failures and rogue traders. Despite popular opinion, we think the demise of Bering's was not caused by the action of a lone wolf who gamed the system for his own gain. The story is much more complicated than that as well. So the reason why they say the story is much more complicated than that is mainly because Nick Leeson was a directional um, uh, trader for uh, Bearings Bank. And if you look at the case of uh, Nick Leeson, you see that um, he, the story behind the failure of Bearings Bank was mainly because um, Nick Leeson, uh, they, 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 they had, um, 
they had an account. Remember back then, right now when people are trading at the at the exchanges, there, right? They um they they are doing it electronically. Like for example, on your computer, you can just indicate your trades, and you can also be able to trade wherever you are as well, right? But back then, you would go, you would now sit wherever you are at the exchange, and then you would pass on. A, 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 an indication for someone who's your runner to actually what go to the pit and indicate whether they want to buy one they want to sell and how much is the quantity that they want what take a long uh, a buying position or a selling position as for right now because of this it basically means that they was bound to be communicational problems where there's now information being passed on to someone else to actually do the trade for for, for the what for the for the trader as well so because of this they were maintaining a particular account, they called it a uh, five eights account, where if there's any errors, and those errors would now be sitting in the five eights account so that it's, 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 the, the, the errors are going to be sitting there so that if there's any errors, they would later on be corrected What in uh, after you've taken into account exactly how much of the error you've made as well. Now, when it comes to Nick listening, someone made a mistake and uh, they lost a couple of, uh, about 100 million, but because he had made a lot of money previously, and because he had a lot of influence and control when it comes to um, the front office and the back office of Bearings Bank, you will see that now the risk management failures came about from uh, from the uh, from the case where he was able to manipulate systems in the in the front in the back office. And he was the one who was found on the front office doing the trade, executing the trade. Because remember, the people in the back office are the ones who are going to be doing the risk management activities. They are the ones who are now going to be accounting for to see exactly where uh, if the trades have gone accordingly as well, as well, uh, as well and also accounting for those trades as well. So which means that they needed they there was a failure in the risk management system, mainly because he was able to influence what was happening in the front office and what was happening in the back office as well. So he was able to, so after realizing that he had, he had lost about 100 million, what did he do? He put that money into that uh, escrow account and then he thought he was going to actually um, be able to recover that loss as well. So he hit that loss and he thought he was going to be able to recover that loss. And what happened now, he ended up now uh, falsifying statements so that he's able to actually get more funding in such a uh, up to a point where they say that at some point he was he had taken a long position on on futures trades for seven billion uh, uh, for seven billion as well and eventually his losses end up running to about eight hundred something eight hundred something million pounds as well so which means that. The main reason there was a risk management failure when it comes to the case of Bearings Bank was mainly because they there was lack of risk management control where, when it comes to the, the management. Because the management just let him do whatever he wanted, mainly because they they he was previously he was making a lot of money for the bank. And because the, the banks were so focused on making a lot of profits, they just allowed him to do everything that he was supposed to be doing. There was lack of accountability, mainly because that he was he was not accountable to anyone, mainly because all the recommendations that were made, he's the one who was also made, uh, uh, handling the recommendations, which means that he was not even implementing the recommendations and the management was not even involved in the implementation and overseeing the implementation of the recommendations as well. So you see that it means risk management failures usually emanate from what lack of accountability, uh, lack of um, uh, transparency, and also lack of controls within the system of the bank as well. So because of this, it basically means that this is the reason why you see that uh, Bearings Bank ended up what running into difficulties as well. Is there any question when it comes to uh, the case of uh, Bearings Bank. You can go through the case study, but I'm not going to go too much in detail with it, mainly because go through the case study so that you see exactly what went wrong, so that in practice you're able to know exactly what went wrong and how you can actually improve the risk management activities for your own organization. But it's not something that I would say you are going to be examined directly when it comes to the exam as well. Is there any question? So when it comes to Section 1.2, another company that in recent history that had more or less the same problem that um, Bellings Bank had 
was the case of Steinhoff as well. Because remember, with the case of Steinhoff, you can see that with Marcus used as well, which is an ongoing case, it's still the same problems that they have been having, where even the board, uh, the, uh, the, the, the board and the chairman were, were not even uh, able to see the true picture of what was happening in Steinhoff, mainly because Marcus Hughes was actually cooking the books and he was able to actually control the systems and also the control systems he was able to actually what being is the one who was basically in control of everything as well. And because of this, it basically meant that this is one of the reasons why um, Steinhoff also ended up what uh, suffering a lot of losses as well. And if you check in the recent news, the, the, the unfortunate thing is that Steinhoff was such a big international company such that even from a South African perspective, investigating Steinhoff basically is, uh, is, uh, is proving very difficult as well. Unlike other cases, like for example, VBS Bank, where we also see, we also know what happened with VBS Bank, but when it comes to Steinhoff as well, it was such a big international conglomerate and it happened over a very long period of time, such that even the Hawks themselves, for them to do the, uh, the special investigation unit, for them to be able to actually do the investigations, they even had to end up asking for funding from Steinhoff itself to do the investigation. If you check what was happening, what was being said in the recent news as well. Although we know that there's an ongoing case uh, that is happening also in Germany as well, to try to see and investigate what, what was happening in Steinhoff as well. Are there any questions? The next case is to do with HIH. And when it comes to HIH, it was an Australian in, uh, insurance company. And this company, there was a lot of pressure for on the management to perform. So there was a lot of pressure on the management to, to perform. And because of this, there was a lot of misrepresentation of information uh, to the relevant parties as well. Where you find that they, even the management themselves, they were getting caught up in situations where they were even, um, they, 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 they were even misrepresenting the financial statements. And even the chairperson was, uh, was actually ended up even misleading the, uh, the, the, the investors to say, we are affiliated with a particular company so we know that the company, our company is going to be doing well. And then mainly because uh, at the end of the day, it was also trying to actually uh, uh, push the company to invest in, in a company that it, it was also having what financial interest in as well. So you see that all these, if you look at the case of HIH as well, you can just go through it on your, on your own, but there is a lot of similarities when you look at the case of uh, when you look at the case of Steinhoff as well and the case of HIH, mainly because there was a lot of misrepresentation of uh, from the from the different parties uh, of the company as well, and even if you look at um, the the lack of controls within those companies were also failing mainly because even if you look at the um, the external uh, the external auditors as well. They were giving auditing services and other services to the company as well. And what what was happening? It basically means that the most of the company the company that was doing the external audit for the for 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 HIH was having a, was compromised mainly because they, there was now an issue where they they are uh, they are earning the audit fees from that company. They are earning the fees from other activities from the company as well. And because of this, it basically means that the, the external auditor was highly dependent financially on HIH. And because of that, it basically means that they ended up being what? Compromised as well. So which, which means that because they were compromised, it basically means that there was lack of enforcement of the recommendation that the, what? the auditors would have actually what? identified as well. Then you also find that, um, there was lack of accountability for the performance. There was lack of integrity in the company's internal process through the enforcement specific internal control measure, right? So there was lack of um, enforcement of internal measures, uh, enforcement of the internal measures, control measures for the company as well. And you also find that um, 
they, two members of the audit committee were former directors of the firm, hence there was lack of what? Financial, uh, there was lack of what? Of, um, of independence as well. Mainly because the, the, if the two members of the audit committee were former directors of the firm, it basically means that they, there was now a problem where these two directors already had relations with the people that, with the management of the company. And because of that, it basically means that there was lack of independence, mainly because they were already having what relations with the directors, of the, with the uh, management of the company as well. So which means that enforcing of the, of, 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 uh, of the recommendations that would have been done by the different what external auditors, internal auditors as well, would have was proving what very difficult because the two um, uh, members here, they were so compromised and they were also influencing the other uh, members of the audit committee to actually what, whenever there was recommendation that that needed to be done in this way, and in ensuring that there was lack of enforcement of those recommendations as well. Are there any questions when it comes to HRH? Next, there is also the case of uh, Home A uh, in 2004. And the case here is the place that wouldn't fly. So they say Home A is a dead subject of Delta, of Delta Airlines. The airline experienced an IT incident in, uh, on 24 December 2004 when the company's crew scheduling system failed, right? So when it comes to the case of Com Air, this is where the, the risk management failure happened, not necessarily because there was lack of accountability, not necessarily because there was misrepresentation and not necessarily because there was lack of transparency within the organization or not necessarily because there was fraudulent activity happening within the organization. If you look at the cases that we have seen so far from unit 1.1, 1.2 1 and 1.3, right? The risk management failures were mainly emanating from the issues that I've discussed now, right, so far, right? But when it comes to the case of Com A, it's a little bit different, although there was a risk management failure. So when you look at the case of Com Air, they were in the process of changing their scheduling system for flights. So they, they were having an old system that they were busy uh, moving from the old system into the new system there, right? So now what happened with Com Air is that there was, um, there was, you know, if you check in the U, it's, it's basically a case that is based in the US as well. So there was, you know, in the US, there's a lot of snow, but there's a lot of snow. Uh, some parts of the US, there's a, they, they, they do snow there, right? And when there's snow, it basically mean, meant that the tech, uh, the runway is, is, is going to be, it would be covered in snow and ice as well, right? So it would not be safe for the planes to either uh, land or take off on the runway. So which meant that the company now uh, was having an issue where they are busy moving from one, one system to another system. And at the same time, they, was not, they now had to reschedule a lot of their flights, right? So they had to reschedule a lot of their flights mainly because there was a lot of, uh, the, the, the place was what, the, the, the snowing in that area was intense for a very sustained period of time as well. So what the company had failed to actually take into account was that they didn't even know that their system that they used for uh, scheduling uh, flights or for, for booking um, uh, for, for booking when, uh, when, for booking when people want to fly was actually had a maximum number of uh, up, uh, like a number of what um, bookings that could be done as well. So the system reached a maximum number that they could be uh, that they could, it could take for a given period of time, but at the same time, there is now a crisis where they now they remember they now have to actually what 
uh, uh, reschedule a lot of what a lot of the bookings that were done as well. So the system crashed, and at the same time it's snowing, and at the same time you have other people who are coming into the airport expecting that their flight is gonna is gonna take off, and only to realize that they are not able to actually what to 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 go where they want to go as well. And at the same time, there was now a situation where even some of the crew members, because there was a lot of snow that was happening as well, and an intense storm, it basically meant that some of the crew who were supposed to be coming into the airport to actually assist the company with um, uh, assisting the the, 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 the clients, well, the clients wants to be assisted to see to see exactly how they can actually mitigate the, 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 the problem there, were also stranded somewhere else. And this uh, led to uh, a lot of chaos when it comes to what to the flights as well. So when it comes to the case of Com Air, you will see that um, the risk management failure was mainly emanating from uh, uh, the, 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 the system failure, right? So it was mainly emanating from a system failure, not necessarily because of nefarious what uh, activities of the uh, different employees of the organization as well. So this is where there's a, a direct um, difference between the case of Com A and the other cases that you've seen so far. So we can go through the case study, but just take note of the different information that is given there. But when it comes to study unit 1.1 to 1.4, don't spend a lot of your time on those study units. Are there any questions? So you can go through study unit 1.1 to 1.4, but don't spend a lot of, of your time there, mainly because I don't see those study units to be highly examinable. So just go through them so that you have a, a, a good understanding in practice of exactly where the different uh, risk management uh, failures were occurring and why they occurred when it comes to these particular case studies as well. And exactly, the, especially when you now look at them, when you're now compare, comparing them with the case of the companies that are also South African based, like for example, ESCOM and uh, um, Steinhoff as well. Can we move on to unit 1.5? So study unit 1.5 looks at um, so study unit 1.5 looks at um, risk management failures. What are they, and when do they happen? Then, when it comes to study unit 1.5, the under self assessment they ask us to address these four issues. So they ask us to argue the case that our LTCM demise was caused by um, a risk management failure, compare the roles and responsibilities of risk management and top executive management, discuss the types of risk management failures, discuss the alternatives that enterprise can consider to prepare for future crisis as well, right? So now this is the article that they ask us to look at when it comes to uh, the issue of risk management failures. Then, so there are two articles that I gave you. Both of them, they basically discuss the same thing. I'm going to use this article that I sent, uh, that I gave out from the Fisher College of Business, mainly because it's the one that I'd highlighted previously. So it's the one that is highlighted, but both articles basically discuss the same thing. So if I send you the sec first article and the second article, you see that they basically cover the same, the same issues as well. So now, when it comes to risk management failures, what are they and when do they happen? They discuss this based on the case of LTCM. So they discuss this based on the case of um, LTCM. And uh, it's uh, this company. Um, and the reason why this company basically failed is mainly because um, the company itself was made up of highly qualified individuals who formulated a hedge fund. So they formulated the hedge fund, and these individuals, they um, when they formulated the hedge fund, 
they uh, they were actually manage, managing the money, but as they were highly qualified individuals, because some of them were professors, some of them were a doctorate degrees as well. So they one of the reasons why the company failed is mainly because they um uh they had sophisticated models that they were using to estimate the risk. And one of the models that they were using, uh, we'll discuss it briefly later on, but don't worry much about uh, in detail exactly how it's calculated, is the concept of value at risk model, right? So it's one of the models that was used to actually estimate the risk to see exactly how much the risk the company was taking. Remember what, what we said? is that for when it comes to managing the investment, you want to make sure that you understand the relationship between risk and return. Why are we interested in this? Is mainly because you want to maximize return for a given level of risk, and you want to minimize your risk for a given level of what? Of return. So because of this, it basically means that if you make an error in estimating how much risk you are taking, you will have a situation where you are actually doing the opposite, where your risk is too high for the return that you're expecting what to, to get as well. So which means that you must ensure that you're able to actually estimate how much risk are you taking for the returns that you're seeking to, what, to get as well. So now, this company, remember we said that it was a hedge fund. They were, uh, as a hedge fund, they uh, remember when it comes to hedge funds, let me just give a brief background on the concepts of hedge funds, right? Now, when it comes to investment managers or fund managers, when they are investing money, there are different vehicles that they can use to actually invest money. A typical investment vehicle that we know in South Africa is where we look at unit trust, right? So if you look at unit trust, in the US, they call the mutual funds as well, right? So if, the, if you hear the word mutual fund or unit trust, you should know that it's one of the same thing because in South Africa, we typically call them unit trusts, but in the US, they call them mutual funds. So when it comes to these uh, unit trust investments, it's another vehicle that can be used, but remember there are different restrictions which are involved when it comes to unit trust investments because there's a regulation that has to be followed when it comes to unit trust investment because you are investing money for the general public which means that there are certain restrictions that they also put in place to ensure that what you uh, um, you invest using those guidelines. But now, when it comes to hedge funds, because hedge funds you you are because with the hedge funds there's very limited restrictions on exactly how the hedge, uh, the fund manager can actually invest the money. In most cases, their mandate is to invest whichever way they can see that they're able to get returns. So one way that with unit trust that is not allowed is where you are short selling, for example, where you borrow a particular, um, a particular, um, for example, a particular security with the expectation that the share price or the security price is going to go down, then you sell it immediately in the, mar in the market so that when you buy it back and take it back to the original owner, you are going to be able what? to have actually buy it back at a lower price. And this is how you make money as well, right? Because you're anticipating the market to go down. So with the unit trust investments, you're not allowed to do that. But with hedge funds, you are part of your mandate is that it allows you to actually follow that investment strategy to invest the money for the hedge fund, for the investors as well. So what do we see? Now, when it comes to LTCM, they were having a situation where they were using highly sophisticated models to actually identify the risk, which means that they didn't fully account for the risk that they were, that they were taking as well. Then now they were using the value at risk model uh, to actually identify the risk. But now later on, it was actually identified that the value at risk model is actually more relevant for banks than what? Hedge funds. And another issue that they also encountered when it comes to LTCM is that they, they were highly leveraged. So they were highly leveraged in, in, in such a situation where um, they had uh, their 
they had, uh, for example, they say um, the company had a high leverage ratio of 28 to 1 and even grew further to 55 to 1. Where the lever when it comes to the leverage ratio, this is where, remember we said that accounting equation says your asset is equal to equity plus liabilities, right? So leverage goes back to the issue where we are saying that to finance the assets of the business, how much liabilities are you utilizing to finance the assets of the business? So if you look at the case of LTCM, they were saying that for one dollar that was invested by the equity shareholders, which is the owners of the business, they were borrowing $28. So in simple terms, for one dollar that was uh, that there was finance to finance the, the assets which are going to be invested by the hedge fund for one dollar that was being used to finance the assets of the business twenty eight dollars was being used was which was being what borrowed and they say later on oh sorry 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 so they they also say so which means that for one dollar that was being used to finance the assets of the business twenty eight dollars was being what was being borrowed. So that's basically what they mean when they say the leverage ratio was so much. So one is to 28 means for one dollar that is being used, uh, that is being contributed by the owners of the business towards the assets of the business to buy, to invest that money, the 28 dollars was being borrowed from external parties. And they say it even grew to as much as um, one is to 55, which means for one dollar that was being used, but that was being contributed by the owners of the business, $55 was being borrowed. So do you see how much risk the liability contributors were contributing, were taking when it comes to the business? Because remember, the higher the, the debt, debt is not necessarily a bad thing for the entity. So debt is not necessarily a bad thing for the entity. But what do we know? If someone comes to you today and they say, they want to borrow money, right? If you know this person is owing part A, another person, another person in a lot of money, it means that the more money this person is owing other people, the higher the chance that if anything goes wrong, they are going to be likely to default on their obligations. So what do we see? Here, the contributors from the liability holders, which is the debt holders, remember liability, is basically it's debt financing, right? So it means the debt holders or the debt financiers here are the ones who are, who are taking a lot of risk, mainly because the equity holders are only for one dollar that the equity holders are contributing, fifty-five dollars is being borrowed, is basically debt financing. And the more debt financing a company has, the higher the chance that if anything goes wrong, they're going to be failing, to, they're going to fail to meet their obligations as well. So what do we see? The high leverage nature of LTCM also meant that if anything goes wrong in meeting their obligations, the owners of the business would only lose one dollar, but the debt financiers, which is the external parties who've got nothing to do with the operations of the business, because we know, we know that under normal circumstances, debt holders, they are outsiders to the firm, which means that they have no influence on exactly what should happen with the company unless they put in certain covenants as well. But they are the ones who are taking on a lot of risk in this case, because remember, $55 was coming from debt holders and only $1 was coming from what? Ordinary share, equity holders as well. So, high risk, high expected return. But at the same time, if the company performs very well, what do we know about the structure of equity and liabilities? If the company performs very well, the liability holders, they still get the return that they agreed to, to get. If they say that, if we give you financing, we're going to charge you 5% interest. No matter how much risk the company is taking, they are still getting, going to get 5% interest. But for the ordinary shareholders, if the company takes on more risk and, the, and, and it pays off, they get more money. But if the company takes on risk and it doesn't pay off, they are going to lose their money. 
but what do we see here? If the company fails after the take on risk, they are going to lose one dollar, but the, the debt holders are facing in total a loss of what? $55. So if there's a lack of risk management controls within the organization, or if risk management fails, it basically means that these debt holders are overexposed because they are being owed a lot of money. So now in 1997, if you look at the, there was an Asian financial crisis that happened in 1997, if you look at it historically, and in 1998, there's a, there was a Russian financial crisis that also happened. And all these ex exogenous, so when we talk about exogenous shocks, these are the shocks into the system that are, that are coming from what? External elements. So when it comes to the hedge fund, these, issues that the company has no control over ended up affecting the company, mainly because this financial crisis means the market went down. And if the market went down, what happens? There was, they, it means that whatever position that they would have taken there, if they didn't take the right position, they're going to be what? Losing out money. So what do we see? If the company suffers losses, what's going to happen? It means these two financiers of the company are going to be facing a lot of risk that they're going to lose out money as well. And especially when it comes to the, the debt holders, they, there is a risk that they're they going to fail to re receive the uh, interest of, uh, the interest that they're expecting to get either from the loans or from the bonds, or they're going to now fail to get back what the principal amounts that they would have what given out to the company as well to finance its activities as well. So the, the, if you look at the case, they tell us that the fund lost about 4.6 billion US dollars and it was built out by 11 firms under the supervision of the Federal Reserve. And the Fed liquidated and dissolved it in early 2000 as well. So because of these, risk management failures and the external factors that ended up resulting in losses for the firm, it basically meant that the company now ended up what are uh, failing to operate. Yes, they even tried to bail it out, but at the end of the day, it still wasn't enough to actually what sustain the operations of the company as well. So if you go back to the case, now if you quickly go back to the case, you will see that um, on page um, on page two of the article, on page two of the article, so on page two of the article, line number seven, they say this article does not examine the subprime financial crisis or problems of financial institutions during the crisis, uh, crisis directly. Rather, it is an attempt to make sure that if risk management is blamed, it, will, it is for the right reasons. And if you go to the, if you skip the next sentence after that, they say, the author then says, I therefore show when bad outcomes can be blamed on risk management and when they cannot. So in the process of doing so, I provide a, typolo uh, a, a typology of risk management failure. So the, if the, the lecturer, the, 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 the person, the author of the article basically it identifies exactly how identifies how you are able to show when risk management failures. So, you, so for you to say that this failure of the organization was because of risk management failures, how are you able to actually identify that as well? Then if you go to the next page, if you go to the next page, uh, on, pay, on line number seven, they say, we look at was the collapse of long-term capital management, which is LTCM, a risk management failure. And here they say, before its collapse, LTCM had a capital close to 5 billion, assets in excess of 100 billion, 
and uh, derivatives for a notional amount in excess of one trillion. So by mid-September, LTCM capital had fallen by more than 3.5 billion and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York coordinated a rescue to, by private financial institutions that injected 3.65 billion in the fund. So does, does a loss of more than 70% of capital represent a risk management failure? Does a, a loss that requires a rescue by banks involving an injection of 3.65 billion of new capital show that risk management failed? It turns out that it is not easy to answer this question. So to, to define a risk management failure, one must first define the role of risk management. So in a typical firm, the role of risk management is first to assess the risk faced by the firm, communicate this risk to those who make risk taking decisions for the firm, and finally, manage and monitor those risks to make sure that the firm only bears the risk its management and board of directors want to bear. So when we look at this part of the text, very, very important, because we are going to be referring quite a lot to this part of the text. The risk management department of the, of the organization, please take note, the risk management department of the organization, its mandate is to identify and assess the risks faced by the enterprise. So the mandate of the risk management department, its mandate is to identify and assess the risks faced by the organization. Once they do that, they now communicate this risk that they've identified to the management and the board of directors as well. Then the management and board of directors are the ones who are going to say, how much risk are we prepared to take? Remember, typically when it comes to risk, there are three main broad categories of risk. Remember, it, we can say um, there is low risk, moderate risk, and then there is what? There is high risk as well, right? So which means now the risk management uh, department of the organization, their mandate is now to find out exactly if we take on this risk, how is it? Is it a low risk? Is it a moderate risk? Is it a high risk? So which means that whenever, like for example, an organization is pursuing certain projects, the risk management department of the organization, their mandate is not to say, now we need to assess this risk to see how much risk are you taking. Even for financial firms as well, it means that they also need to be able to identify to say, if a trader embarks on this particular uh, trade, how much risk are they taking? So they need to be, so the mandate of the risk management department is to identify the risk, assess the risk, and then communicate to the board of directors and the management to say, how much risk will you be taking if you make this move? If we do this, how much risk are we taking? Then now the management of the company and the board of directors are the ones who are going to be saying, Overall, it is an organization. We are either only prepared to take low risk investments or low risk uh, investments when we're looking at what? Maximizing the value of the firm. Are we prepared to take moderate risk? Are we taking, prepared to take high risk? Or are we prepared to take a, 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 a risk which is between low and moderate? Or are we prepared to take a risk which is between moderate and what? And high risk, depending on exactly how they categorize the risk. So sometimes instead of putting it as low and moderate, maybe they can put it in number terms to say uh, one is low risk and 10 is what? High risk. Then they now categorize to see exactly how much risk are we taking depending on, depending on that as well. So please bear in mind that the mandate of the risk management department is to identify the risk and assess the risk, then they communicate the risk to the board of directors. Then the board of directors and the management are the ones who are going to now decide how much risk are we prepared to take as an organization. Then it also means that now after this, the organization is run, isn't it? 
It means even for traders themselves, they should also know that whatever trading activities that they take, if the mandate of organization is to take, for example, moderate risk, it would mean that they are now going to make, they need to make sure that overall on their portfolio, their portfolio is taking on moderate risk so that they stick to the mandate that they've been given by the what board of directors as well. And that way it would mean that if that is the case and there's proper monitoring and control system within the organization, if a trader ends up taking a high risk investment without indicating and justifying exactly why they're taking that high risk investment and how it's gonna affect their overall portfolio, it would also mean that if there's proper systems and control in place, they will be flagged by the what risk management department and something's gonna be done before what the losses they escalate. But what do we see? If you look at the case of um, even ESCOM itself, if you look at the case of HIH, if you look at the case of, um, what is that? Uh, ESCOM, HIH, then if you also look at the case of Bearings Bank as well. One thing that was in common is that this, the management failed on their part to actually have systems in place to control and monitor the risk that is being taken by the organizations. Mainly because there was lack of transparency and in some cases was a lot of what fraudulent activities that was being done, mainly because that the systems within the organizations were failing on the monitoring and measurement part to see exactly if the organization is sticking to the mandate that they've been given by the what board of directors as well. So do you see the issues involved on why risk management failures would actually come into place, especially when you look at the case study that we actually looked at previously? Any questions? Next. If you skip the next sentence or the next two sentences, they say, because firms are generally more concerned about unexpected losses, a frequently used risk measure of value at risk, a measure is a measure of, uh, of downside risk. So value at risk is the maximum loss at a given confidence level over a given period of time. So the measure might be estimated daily or over longer periods of time. So which means the value at risk measure basically says that you are trying to estimate to say over a period of a day or over a period of a week or over a period of a month or over a period of a year, what is the maximum loss we're expecting to suffer as an organization? Now, what do we see? When it comes to, when it comes to hedge funds, remember we say, when it comes to hedge funds, remember we say that with the hedge funds, there is no limitation on exactly where the fund manager is able to actually invest the money, right? So you will see that overall on their portfolio, they can even have a situation where their portfolio is right, high leverage, where there's a lot of risk that they're taking as well. Now, what do we see? When it comes to banks, they say the value at risk measure is more relevant for banks than hedge funds, mainly because when it comes to banks, a lot of regulations are involved where there's limitation of exactly how much risk banks take. And in most cases, when it comes to the banks, remember with the banks, the debt holders here are the people who are contributing to the banks, like for example, the depositors, right? There are people who are going to say, I want to deposit so much money into the bank. And because they're depositing so much money into the bank, then the bank takes that money and invests that money as well. So you see that the valid risk measure, remember I say it's the maximum loss that the organization is expecting to suffer over a given period of time. So what does that mean? Because banks usually, they, when it comes to the limitations of exactly where they can invest money, they, uh, they invest in low risk type of what investments. And because of that, it basically means that it's easy to estimate exactly 
if the worst case scenario, how much is the maximum loss we're expecting to suffer over a given period of time? Mainly because banks, they don't uh, invest a lot of their money in what? High risk investment. In most cases, because they're investing, majority of the money is coming from depositors, it means that they're investing that money in low, low risk investment because remember, with depositors, they can want their money back at any time as well. And because of that, they usually invest in what? Short term. Um, short-term, low-risk type of investments, unless they also do long-term, like for example, giving out what? Giving out long-term loans as well. But what do we see? With hedge funds, there's no limitation of exactly where the fund manager is gonna be playing around with their portfolio as well. So because of this, it basically means that because as you're seeking high-risk investments, you now, it's now going to be very difficult to estimate exactly how much is the maximum loss that, that you can suffer over a given period of time. And even if you look at the case of LTCM, we see that it was highly leveraged. And because it was highly leveraged, investing in high risk investments as well, it, this is the, one of the reasons why it actually ended up failing, mainly because the losses escalated more than they expected them to escalate as well. So they ended up suffering losses more than they are actually what? Anticipated. Why? Because they were using what? Sophisticated systems. And part of the system that they were using there in estimating the risk was not necessarily meant for, uh, for, for measurement of the risk that they were expecting to suffer there. So the losses ended up escalating and they ended up suffering what? Uh, huge losses as well. So if you go back to the case, if you go back to the case, So here they just, in the case study, they basically say, so using the variable risk, they worked out that 99% of the time, they would earn an average return of about 25%. So explaining it in, 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 in years, it means over a 99 year, uh, over, over 99 years, that the return and a one year loss are in excess of what? Of 20%. So they're basically saying that over a period of 99 years, we're expecting to have returns of 25% or more. And only one year, which is basically over the 100 years, there's only one year that we're expecting to suffer losses in excess of 20%. But what do we see? Because the company was highly leveraged, they ended up suffering losses which were more than 25%, mainly so, which means that this is the reason why they were saying that the valued risk measure for this company, for, for this hedge fund, was not appropriate measure to see exactly how much is the loss that they, that they would suffer over a given period of time as well. Then if you go to page five, on page five, paragraph number two, they say, deciding whether to take a, a known risk is not a decision for risk managers. The decision depends on the risk appetite of the institution. So however, defining the risk appetite is a decision for the board and top management. So that decision, is at the heart of the firm's strategy and of how it creates value for its shareholders. Remember what I was saying. In the pursuit of maximizing uh, shareholders' wealth, you are trying to maximize what? The value of the firm. So in trying to maximize the value of the firm, we know that the higher the risk, the higher the debt financing you are, you are used, the higher the debt financing, the higher the, what? the risk that you're taking. Which basically means that now the risk appetite of the organization the decision on the risk appetite of the organization to say, are we going to take low risk, moderate risk, or high risk is dependent on what? The board of directors and the management as well. So if you go to the next paragraph on line number five, they say, for instance, you have to scale back to its investment because of being financially constrained. You have to sell assets in unfavorable markets, lose valuable employees who become concerned for their bonuses, lose customers who are concerned about the institution being um, distracted or not having the sufficient resources to help them and face increased scrutiny from what? Regulators. So these are the, some of the implications that would now come into place when if the company ends up suffering losses, uh, suffering losses as well. So what do we see? We're basically saying that the cascading effect of a company suffering losses is that they are now going to be forced to scale down operations. And if they scale down operations, it means what? Lower returns. And at the same time, 
they are now, because they are trying to scale down operations, they have to sell some of the assets. And because they are selling some of the assets, it means that if the markets are low, like for example, we are suffering a financial crisis, it means that, for example, an asset that would have, an investment that would have bought for hundred dollars per unit, you are now going to be forced to sell it at a lower price, for example, at $60 per unit or even $30 per unit as well. So what does that mean? It means the organization is going to suffer what? Even more losses as well. And because now people are seeing or the different stakeholders are seeing that the company is suffering, there's loss of confidence in that organization. And because of loss of confidence in the organization, it means the key employees who are influential in making sure that the company is able to recover might even lose, lose that employee because the employee is saying, I'm seeing that the company is going down under, so I'd rather jump ship before what to protect my uh, my employment as well. So, and then the customers are also going to what lose confidence in the organization, and even the different suppliers or traders are who are going to be uh, or, or the different what uh, parties or stakeholders who are going to be uh, involved in the running of the organization are going to lose confidence, and that ends up even what making cascade the uh, loss of what confidence in the organization which also re re uh, results in the demise of the organization as well so if you go to the next page on paragraph number two line number four they say at the end of 1997 ltc made capital of 7.4 billion but decided to uh, retain roughly 36 percent of the capital to its investors with less capital ltcm could still execute the same trades however now to implement them, it now it had to borrow more and hence to increase its leverage. So by increasing its leverage, it could boost the return to its shareholders if things went well at the expense of making less if things went poorly. So was, was increasing leverage at a poor risk management, was increasing a leverage a poor risk management decision. So remember, leverage here, is the use of debt financing. So use of debt, debt is not necessarily a bad thing. So debt is not necessarily a bad thing. But at the end of the day, you want to be able to help to find yourself in a position where the, the cost, of fine, cost of capital is at its lowest and the firm value is at its highest. Which means that the, when you look at that relationship, you want to ensure that you are having the optimum amount of what? Of debt. So debt is not necessarily a risk management failure. So use of more debt is not necessarily a risk management failure, but it becomes a risk management failure if you are using debt at the detriment way, you're not able to maximize what? The value of the firm. So this is basically where use of debt becomes what? A risk management failure. So if you go to the next paragraph, they say, uh, if you go to the uh, next page on the second paragraph, say, in summary, risk management does not prevent losses. With good risk management, large losses can occur when those making the risk taking decision conclude that taking large, well understood risk creates value for the organization. So remember what I told you. When it comes to risk financing, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you maximize shareholders' role. Well. And how do you maximize shareholders' role? Well? By maximizing the value of the organization. Then if you look at uh, a typology of the risk management failures. Now, this, make sure that you take note of this as well to see exactly how do you understand the different uh, risk and how do you understand the six, uh, six what, risk, risk management failures as well. So if you go to uh, line number five, they say, two types of mistakes can be made in measuring risk. Known risk can be mismeasured and some risk can be ignored, either because they are known or viewed as non-material, once risks are measured, they have to be communicated to the firm's leadership. So a failure in the communicating uh, in communicating risk to the management is a risk management failure as well. So after management decides what kind of risk to take, risk management has to make sure that the firm takes these risks. So in other words, risk managers must then manage the firm's risk at times that may involve identifying appropriate risk mitigation actions Hedging some risk and rejecting some proposed what trades or projects as well. So, with that, with this perspective, there are six types of risk management failures. So, we're going to be looking at the six types of risk management failures. So, please take note. If ever the lecturer is going to ask questions in the exam, 
you need to be able to know these six types of risk management failures. So if ever the lect lecturer wants to uh, or, or, um, ask, the, 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 ask questions in the exam, you need to be able to know the six types of risk management failures. The first one being mismeasurement of known risks. The second one, failure to, uh, to take risk into account. And the third one, failure in communicating the risks to top management. And the fourth one, failure in monitoring the risk. And fifth, failure in managing risk. And then the sixth one, failure to use appropriate risk metrics. So let's look at the first one, mismeasurement of known risks. So here, if you look, go back to the case of LTCM, if you look, check on line number four, they say, risk managers could make a mistake in assessing the probability of a large loss or the size of the large loss if it occurs. However, in addition, this could use they could use the ROS, uh, the wrong what, a distribution altogether, right? For example, they can use the binomial distribution, or in, in case of what, uh, instead of using the what, the normal distribution and identifying and uh, collecting the risk that they they're, they're expecting to uh, to suffer as well. So here they say, if you skip the next sentence, they say a simple way to put this is that correlations may be mismeasured, right? So correlations are extremely important in risk management because they benefit of diversification falls as correlation what right, increase as well. So here, when it comes to the concepts of correlation, we are going to be discussing correlation coefficient quite often as well. So the correlation coefficient, so correlation shows the relationship between two different uh, components. So the, so the correlation basically shows the relationship between two different components and the correlation coefficient varies between minus one and plus one. When something is a correlation of plus one, it basically means that they are, their characteristics are very much related to each other. Like for example, from an investment perspective, you can be asked to say, for example, investment option one, you are considering investing in Mercedes-Benz and you are investing some of your shares in BMW, right? So either considering investing your shares in Mercedes-Benz and some of the shares in BMW, and investment alternative two, you are considering investing your shares in BMW, and you are considering investing some of your shares in what? In, uh, let's say, um, say ShopRite, right? Of these two investment alternatives, which one do you think is a better investment alternative in one. So as an investor, you have two alternatives that you're considering investing in. Investing your shares in Mercedes-Benz and some of your shares in BMW, or investing some of your shares in BMW and some of your shares in ShopRite. So of these two investment alternatives, which one do you think is a better investment alternative in one? Maybe two because it's um, it consists of two different types of entities. Yes. So in this simplified example, you would consider investing in two mainly because if anything goes wrong in the man a car manufacturing sector, it means that Mercedes Benz and BMW are going to be affected are, are going to be both affected by the same, isn't it? And if anything happens in the car manufacturing sector, it's not necessarily going to affect what shop price because it's in the what food distribution industry as well. So if you look at Mercedes and BMW, you see that the, their relationship or how the returns of these two companies per, uh, 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 perform or react to external information, you will see that they are likely to have a positive correlation, mainly because when one goes up, you're expecting the other one to go up as well, mainly because if, and if one goes down, they expect the other one to go down, mainly because they are affected by more or less the same factors as well. There are slight differences, but they are affected by more or less the same factors as well. But if you look at BMW and ShopRite, the performance of BMW is not necessarily linked to the performance of what? Of ShopRite, because they're in different industries doing what? Different things as well. So you see that there's, Correlation coefficient there is going to be something less than the correlation coefficient of what? Of BMW and Mercedes Benz. So, what does that mean? 
when it comes to correlation coefficient, it means as an investor, when you're looking at investments, you want to try as much as possible to invest in investments with a correlation coefficient closer to what? To minus one. So this, when your correlation coefficient of your investment is at minus one, this is where we say you are fully diversified. So this is where we say your portfolio is fully diversified. So you're fully diversified or you're well diversified if the correlation coefficient of your investments are closer to minus one. So the more they are closer to minus one, the more diversified your portfolio is as well. So which means that whenever we are considering investment, investing, you should always try as much as possible to invest in portfolios with the correlation coefficient to closer to what? Minus one as much as possible. Because the more you are going towards that, so your aim is to have the correlation coefficient closer to minus one as much as possible. I'll go on the same page here. Any questions? So next. So. What is a co a co correlation? If, if it's a, if it's a, if it's zero, what does it mean? It means they they don't have any relation. So it means they don't have any relation at all. At all. So which means that the performance of one does not necessarily affect the performance of the other one as well. So if it's at zero, it means that there's no correlation, there's no correlation between the two securities. Okay. Yeah. So if you look at it more clearly, remember we are saying, for example, these are the returns of, let's say for example, uh, M is for Mercedes-Benz, B is BMW, right? So we have, uh, returns over time, right? So if they have a correlation coefficient of minus one, so what does that mean? It means when you look at the performance of, let's say for example, when it comes to Mercedes-Benz, the correlation coefficient is something like this, right? And when you look at uh, BMW, let's say for example, let's, I'm not saying that it's like this, but I'm just trying to demonstrate why when the, the case where the correlation coefficient is what is minus one. It means when one is, when the correlation coefficient is minus one, it means when one is going up, the other one is going down. And one when one is going down, the other one is going up. So which means that the, the when, when one performs very well, the other is, not, is performing poorly. And when one is performing poorly, the other one is performing very well. So what does that mean? It basically means that your portfolio overall will have a performance which you now net off to something like this. So what does that mean? It basically means that your returns overall are going to be found within a particular what range as well. So because of this, it basically means that there is a better guarantee of having a certain return which is falling within a particular direction, unlike having a situation where the correlation coefficient is what is plus one. Because if it's plus one, it means when one goes down, the other one is going down, which means that your losses are now cascading when, if the market what poorly performs as well. So that's why we say, ideally, you want to have a correlation coefficient which is plus at what? Minus one as much as possible. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Any questions? So on the next paragraph, they say, with the LTC example, it could be that the true probability of a loss of 70% was higher than the 1%, say, uh, 25%. So here, remember we said that when they were using the value at risk measure, they were saying that 99% of the time are expecting positive returns of 25% or more, and 1% of the time, that's when we're expecting um, a loss to suffer a loss as well, right? So which means here they're basically saying that one of the reasons why the value of risk measure failed 
was that that the the probability of suffering a loss of 70 percent of the portfolio like what we saw here was not necessarily one percent it was actually what higher than one percent for example 25 percent and if the probability was 25 percent instead of one percent of what suffering a loss of 75 70 percent or more of the of the portfolio it would mean that when you're now trying to calculate the expected return your assessment would now tell you that this is a bad investment or this is a bad way to invest as well because you're allocating more probability towards a loss which means that if you're also allocating more probability towards a loss it would mean that the overall performance of the portfolio now is going to give you what an overall loss position as well and that way you could now use that to say this is the bad way to invest or this is the correct way to invest as well so they also is, so on the next page on paragraph number three they say when an institution has many positions or projects the risk of the institution depends on how the risk of the different positions or projects are related so if the correlation between the positions or projects is high it is more likely that all the firm's activities perform poorly at the same time which leads to a higher probability of a large loss so these correlations can be difficult to assess and they change over time at times what abruptly as well then on the next paragraph on page 10 on the first paragraph they say in this case risk managers could not be expected to know what correlations will be but the assessment of the risk of a portfolio or the uh, of the firm would depend on their estimates of the distribution of the correlations so in this case it would be possible for realized correlations to be different from their expected value and yet there would be no risk management failure as well then if you go to the next paragraph, if you skip the next paragraph and you go to the next paragraph after that saying historical data is at times of little use because a known risk has not manifested itself in the past. For instance, with the subprime crisis, there was no historical data of downturn in the real estate market during which a large amount of securitized subprime mortgages were outstanding. So in such a situation, risk management so risk measurement cannot be done by simply using historical data since there is a risk of a decrease in real estate prices that is not manifested in itself in the what comparable historical period as well so here they're basically saying that the past does not necessarily predict the future so because of this it basically means that if you are going to now assess a particular company like for example if you are taking trying to identify exactly how much risk the organization is taking it means that if you use it, if you were to, if you look at it, if you had done the assessment of your risk for a particular portfolio before the 2008 financial crisis, remember the 2008 financial crisis was mainly emanating from the uh, sub subprime mortgage losses, isn't right? Where remember the American dream, where people were just getting losses, were sort of were getting loans even though they could not even afford the loans as well, and this is the reason why. We ended up the whole world ended up you know, in a recession because uh the American traders were basically selling those bad loans to other countries as what well, as investments as well. So what does that mean? It basically means that if you try going to try to assess to see exactly how much risk your portfolio was coming from to see to identify the risk, it's gonna be it was, it was going to be very difficult to see exactly how much risk your portfolio was going to be uh, uh, how much risk your portfolio was taking mainly because if you're going to be using historical data there is no data available to actually use to say this is how much it very is going to be coming from the what real estate investment as well mainly because that there was no such crisis that it happened before the 2008 financial crisis as well so historical data yes we use historical data but the idea is you should not always put 100 percent weighting of your assessment to what historical data as well mainly because the past does not necessarily what predict the future as well so which means that when you're not trying to assess to see exactly how much risk you're taking as an organization it means that historical data you need to give it some weighting but you cannot give it what all the weighting to the to your assessment as well then if you go to the next paragraph that say there is a fundamental problem with the performance of risk measurement when assess, uh, assessments become subjective so suppose that all parties agree that the established statistical model works well right so which means 
In addition, then a risk manager establishes and questions the uh, reliability of statistical model used by experts in the field concerned, right? So now the other issue that they are also are highlighting here is that remember, the risk manager uses the available models to assess the risk, right? So which means that within an organization, the statistical, the stati remember, statisticians are the ones who come up with the different models that are basically used. So which means that you as a risk manager, you use the models that are available to you to actually assess to see exactly how much risk the organization is taking as well. Now, here they're basically saying that some of the problems that organizations face is that even if the risk manager starts questioning a particular model that is being used by the organization to identify and assess the risk as well, it would mean that the organization is now going to, the, the, the risk manager sometimes that they feel like it's becoming a, too much of a drag instead of moving forward when you're arguing with the statisticians to say, I'm, I, I'm not happy with this particular model as well, mainly because the statisticians are, statisticians are saying, use this model to identify the risk. But even if you have questions, now we are having a situations where you are now going to be clashing and arguing about whether the organization is using the right model. And in that particular period of time, if especially if it's a financial firm, remember the risks are evolving constantly as well. It basically means that this is why you find that sometimes the risk managers that are found, find themselves in a dilemma where instead of questioning a particular model, they just go with whatever they are given, mainly because they feel it becomes a bit of a drag in actually what assessing and that they are measuring the risk there, mainly because if they were to question the models, it would mean that they're spending a lot of their time questioning the model and trying to assess the model itself instead of what dealing with the more with the ever-changing environment, what that the organization is going to be facing as well. Then if you go to page 11, on line number two, they say, as risk management moves away from established quantitative models, it becomes easily embroiled in the intra-firm politics. So at that point, the outcome for the firm depends much more on the firm's risk appetite and on its culture than on its what risk management models as well. Then the second type of uh, risk management failure is mismeasurement due to ignored risks. And yet the same, ignored risk can take three different forms that are different implications for a firm. First, a firm may ignore a risk even though the risk is known. Second, somebody in the firm knows about the risk, but the risk is not captured by the risk models. And thirdly, there is a realization of a truly unknown risk as well. So this is where now the discussion comes in when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. Would you say it was a known risk or it was an unknown risk? How would you classify them? It's so unknown. Why would you say it was unknown? I don't think anyone could have predicted that there'd be a virus outbreak. A virus that, that especially would be transmitted in the manner in which uh, Corona is transmitted. You know, that would affect the whole world like that. Um, I don't think it's something that anyone could have predicted. All right. Any other contribution before I discuss? Now, this is where many risk managers find themselves in a dilemma. Because if you really effectively look at the coronavirus, right? Remember the COVID-19, right? Previously, remember there was the SARS virus that, that also uh, happened a couple of years back, but it mostly affected the Asian countries. And then there was also the MERS uh, virus, I can't remember the actual coding of it, and they all form part of the what? Group of coronaviruses as well. Now, when you look at accounting for these risks, the COVID-19 is part of a group of coronaviruses, which basically meant that it's going to be argued, it would be argued that the coronavirus would not be classified as an unknown risk. Why? 
because we already knew there was already a group of coronaviruses, although they were now evolving and manifesting themselves in different forms, but we already knew historically, historically there was a, there is a group of coronaviruses as well. What many risk managers had not accounted for is how much is it going to end up affecting the whole world as well? Because now, most of these coronaviruses that also manifested themselves, they were easily contained, mainly because they were contained easily where they, where they happened as well. That's why you see that in most cases, if you look at about 10 years or so back, when they manifested themselves, they were easily co contained by, by, especially when they are manifested in the, in the, if you look at the Asian countries as well. But now the coronavirus is the one that was that um, that they failed to contain, and it ended up what cascading in what into affecting the other countries across the globe as well. So the COVID nineteen would it would be argued that it was uh, it, it was uh, not an, an it was not an unknown risk. The risk was known, but now the dilemma now when it comes to the risk managers is should we account for this risk when it comes to the oper our, our operations and how much weighting should we be putting in assessing uh, the risk that our organizations are being faced? How the, why the dilemma is like that is mainly because you don't know if it manifests itself, how much is it going to end up out affecting the operations? And if you look at it now, over the past year, so many businesses have closed down, but Exactly a year ago, they had not anticipated that the uh, coronavirus would actually come in and actually what uh, and affect the operations of the organization as well. I want okay, to so you well. think that we, the, okay, risk managers underestimated the impact the virus would have on businesses. Correct, okay. correct. So this is where we are now saying that when it comes to the mismeasurements due to ignored risk you are based this is where we're saying that it can be the risk can be can be known but ignored because you're going to say ah, what are the odds that the coronavirus is gonna affect our operations in south africa yes we've heard about it previously affecting other countries in in, in europe in, in in asia but what are the odds that we are going to be affected by this so which means that this is where the dilemma is now to say they would probably know the risk but not account for it. So which means that the risk would be known, but it would what, it, they would what fail to, uh, they, 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 they would ignore the risk mainly because they would say, what are the odds of it happening as well? I want the same page. So if you go to the next paragraph, we look at ignored, Non risks and on the second sentence, they say a good example of this possibility is as follows Before Russia defaulted on its domestic debt in August 1998, many hedge funds took positions where they bought high yielding Russian debt, hedged the debt against the default risk, and finally hedged the debt against the exchange risk as well. It was easy to believe that the resulting position had no risk. However, no hedge, to hedge the current risk, the funds had to sell rubles against what? Uh, against the dollars as well. So here the same, even though it wouldn't have made much difference in the Russian banks, still went down, you find that LTCM didn't even take the steps what? to even try to hedge the risk as well. So which means in this case, when you look at the case study of LTCM, if you go over the case study, it basically means that they knew there was a risk that the Russian government was going to default on the on, on the on their on, on, on their debt, domestic debt as well. And they still ignored this risk, although they knew the risk was what was uh, was there as well. So they didn't even go to actually hedge the risk against what the different positions as well. The third risk management failure is mistakes in information collection. So it's mistakes in information collection. And if you check on line number four, they say, 
If some risks are not accounted uh, for when risk is measured for a firm, the risks left out are not adequately monitored and they can become large because organizations have the tendency to expand and monitor risk. So for instance, consider a trader whose risks are only partly monitored. Typically, traders have a compensation formula that involves an option payoff. So they receive a significant share of the profits they generate but they do not have to get back the losses. So if only some of the risk of a trader are monitored, he can increase his expected compensation by increasing the risks that are not monitored without suffering any of the consequences as well. So which means now when it comes to monitoring the activities of the traders here, yeah, when it comes to the financial firm, they are basically saying that one of the issues that that, that is also faced by the financial firm is an issue where, remember we said that the risk managers, they identify the risk, they present the risk to the what? Board of directors and management. Then the management now decides exactly how much risk they are, they are prepared to take. So which means that they will now say, prepared to say, we are prepared to take risk on these trades and that trade or whatever information that they give the, um, the overall organization there, right? To see exactly how much risk the tra traders can take as well. Then now the other problem that also comes in is a situation where the trader would say, so these risks are being monitored. So I cannot take on, I can go overboard when it comes to what risk boundaries. But those risks that are not monitored by the risk managers, they would now give them a more weighting when it comes to investment options as well. So this would result in a situation where they are now going to now uh, exploit loopholes in the system where they are going to be uh, investing more of their money in the unmonitored risk categories. And that way it would mean result in a situation where if the risk pays off, they get their bonus. But if the risk doesn't pay off, it would mean that there's nothing that they're going to be losing out because remember, but at the end of the day, the organization is the one that's going to be what? Suffering losses as well. So which means this is another situation or another problem that usually organizations face when it comes to monitoring and managing the risk that the traders also take as well. Then on the next page, they also say, accounting for all the risks in risk measurement is a difficult and costly task. However, not performing the task for an organization means that the firm's top executives are managing the company with blinders on. They see only part of the big picture they have to understand to manage effectively. So which means here yeah, they're basically saying that monitoring and accounting for the risk become is a, it can be a very costly activity, mainly because whether if it's a non-financial firm, this is a firm that has got nothing to do with the trading of securities or anything like that, right? Like for example, a manufacturing plant or whatever it is, right? So you see that for a non-financial firm, risk management uh, costs are lower mainly because the environment or the risk factors that affect the organizations they're not changing constantly over a given day or a given week or a given month as well but when it comes to a financial firm it means that a financial firm the uh, cost of accounting and managing the risk becomes an ever uh, it becomes too costly mainly because monitoring and managing would have to be done constantly because remember you can start to trade in the morning and by the end of the day, the things would have changed totally in the market as well. So which means that the monitoring and managing of risk becomes what? And a continuous activity. And if it's a continuous activity, it means that the risk management costs are also going to be expected what? to be higher as well. So which means that this is one of the dilemmas that the companies now are going to be facing to say, so how much, uh, how much monitoring do we need to do for our organization? Because remember, at the end of the day, for, for the organization to maximize the value, the, the value of the firm, they need to minimize the cost. So which means that for them to minimize the cost, that's when they can now say, instead of monitoring constantly, we now have to monitor maybe once a day or once a week. And that way, it also means that the, there's lack of monitoring that is happening, which means that if some if the risk event does happen, especially for a financial firm, it becomes very, very difficult to actually what? Uh, to, to actually account for it and to actually what mitigate the risk before before it escalates into bigger losses as well. Then, if you go to page fourteen, we also look at 
another risk management failure, which is a non, uh, we look at a non, uh, we look at, uh, so we also look at a non risk as well, right? So when you look at a non risk, they're saying, if you skip the next paragraph, they say, other unknown risk may not matter simply because they have a trivial, trivially low probability. There are some there is some probability that the building will be hit by an asteroid. So the risk does not affect any management decisions. So ignoring, ignoring that risk has no implication for risk management. Then if you check on paragraph number three, they say, uh, if you check on paragraph number three, they say uh, on the next paragraph, so line number three, they say, because of this, they have to conclude that they do not capture all risk in their models. And therefore, some capital has to be made available to cope with what? A non risk as well. So it means that there are some, they also have to take into account a non risk so that in case those risks does emanate that they don't really know, it means that they have to what? They, they, it will be accounted for, there will be enough capital available to actually what? There will be enough risk capital available to actually mitigate those risks as well. Next, would be uh, communication failure. So the next risk management failure would be communication failure. And when it comes to communication failure, they say risk management is not an activity undertaken by the risk managers for risk managers. Rather, it is an activity undertaken to enable the firm to maximize shareholders' value by taking optimal decisions across the firm. So if you skip the next sentence, they say, therefore, risk management has to provide timely information to the board and top management that enables them to make decisions concerning the firm's risk and to factor the firm's risk in their decisions. So in order for the board and the top management to understand the risk situation of the firm, this situation has to be communicated to them in a way that they can understand properly. So which means that when when it comes to, remember we said that the risk managers are the ones with the responsibility to communicate the risk that they are, the organization is taking to the uh, parties who are going to be making the decisions on exactly how much risk to take as well. So which means that the party who are going to be making the risk, uh, the, taking the, making the risk decisions, one of the risk management failures is failure to ensure that they are able to understand how much risk and the magnitude of the risk that they're also going to be taking as well. So you might, you might so which means that if they if the managers if the uh, if the management and the board of directors fail to fully understand exactly the magnitude of the risk that they're going to be taking or, or on the risk depending on the risk appetite that they want to take as well, it would mean that this would also result in what in a risk, uh, risk management failure as well. So if you go to the next paragraph or, or on the next page. They also look at another risk management failure, which is failure in monitoring and managing risk. And yet they say, risk management is responsible for making sure that the firm takes the risk that it wants to take and not others. So as a result, risk managers must constantly monitor the risk of the firm is, uh, the firm is taking. So further, they have to hedge and mitigate non-risk to meet the objectives of what? Top management. Then if you go to the next paragraph, line number three, they say, for the typical non-financial firm, risk often change slowly. So not so for financial firms. For a financial firm, risk can change sharply even in the firm, even if the firm does not take new positions. So the problem arises from the fact that the financial firms have many derivative positions and positions that were in, with, uh, with embedded derivatives. So over time, these positions have become more complex as well. So which means that for a financial firm, they are, uh, so for a financial firm, they uh, they also use derivative positions to actually what to make money, right? So when you look at the derivative position that they're talking about, the the different types of derivatives that we talked about so far, when you look at the case of LT, uh, when you look at the case of Bearings Bank as well, remember uh, Nick Leeson was also taking was what showing the direction of what of the futures um, of the Nick uh, of the uh, uh, Nikkei futures uh, contracts there, right? To see exactly are uh, we expecting them to go up or go down and take the position accordingly as well. Now, they are also saying that when it comes to LTCM, it's not only futures position that they were taking positions on. Because remember, they were using derivatives, and there are different types of derivative positions that what a trader can take. Like for example, you can go into a forward contract, you can go into um, a futures contract, you can go 
into a, an options contract and you can also go into what into swap uh, swaps as well so which means that because of this it basically means that they are the the more positions that LTCM was taking was now making uh, making the their trades becoming what more and more complex to now understand exactly what are the implications of the market environment changes and remember the like what i said for a financial firm the market environments change rapidly over a given day as well like for example in a few minutes things can the market can change abruptly so because of this it would not be difficult to understand exactly so what are the indication what are the effects of the change in the market on the position that the organization what would have taken to see exactly are we going to be ex expecting to suffer a loss are we expecting what to start to get to make gains as well which means that if the market is changing abruptly over, over over a short period of time it will be now becoming more and more complex to understand exactly how what are the effects of the changes in the markets on the different different position what otcm in this case would have taken as well so if you go to the next page on paragraph number two they say when the risk characteristics of securities can change very rapidly, it is challenging for the risk monitors to capture these changes and for the managers, for the risk manager to adjust hedges appropriately. So this challenge is especially great when risk characteristics can change dramatically for small changes in the determinants of the security prices. So as a result, risk managers may fail to adequately measure risk or hedge risk simply because risk characteristics of securities may change too quickly to enable these managers to assess the characteristics properly or to put in correct hedges as well so if you go to the next paragraph uh, next page on paragraph number two they say in large complex organizations it is also possible for individuals to take risks that remain hidden for a while a trader might have constructed a complicated position that only he understands. So this position might be such that some, uh, under some circumstances, it could lead to large losses. So the position might use securities that are not incorporated in the risk management system as well. So which means that, remember we're saying, traders sometimes, like, like for example, if it's a hedge fund, they have, they have an open mandate on exactly how they can make um, money as well. So sometimes, the traders might take complicated positions that even them, only them can, can understand exactly what is happening on their trades. But now the monitoring now becomes very difficult because the risk managers now would now have to actually what check to, may, may, might even take time to actually fully understand exactly what are the, uh, the implications of the position that the trader has taken. Is it now falling beyond the scope of the risk that the, what, the organization overall what, should be taking as well. So because of this, it basically means that if things go wrong, it means that, remember we said for, for a financial firm, things change rapidly as well. So it would become very difficult now to understand exactly, uh, to account to see exactly how much risk the organization is overall taking because of what? The ever-changing environment for a financial firm. Then if you go to the next paragraph, they also say, the effectiveness of risk monitoring and control depends crucially on an institution's culture and incentives. So if risk is everybody's business in the organization, it is harder for pockets of risk to be left unobserved. So if employees' compensation is affected by how they take risk, they will take more, uh, they will take risk more judiciously. So the best risk models is in a firm with poor culture and poor incentive will be much less effective than a firm where the incentive of employees are better aligned with the risk-taking objective of the firm as well. So this is where we find the, um, uh, the problem where the principal agent problem where if there is no link between how much the risk the uh, the agent in this case the trader is taking and how much is taking it would mean that if the risk position does not necessarily going to affect their compensation they are going to just take a lot of risk because they know that if the if things go wrong they are going to make a lot of money but if things go badly they, it doesn't have an implication on what on their overall uh, on their pockets as well so we that there has to be a link between the the principal which is basically the, the the company and the agent which is what the trader in this case so they have to make sure that they, there's a link in understanding exactly what the implications of the risk is financially for the principal and financially for what for the agent in this case being the the trader then next we look at uh 
risk measurements and risk management uh risk measurement uh, when you look at risk measure measures and risk management failures as well so we look at which is um uh, here the same so far we have taken the risk metrics as given we now show what that focusing on metrics that are too narrow may make it harder for the management to achieve its objectives so specifically risks that the management would consider important can be left unmeasured or and ignored so a widely used uh, risk measure in financial institutions is a daily valued risk measure for trading activities. So here, if you go to the, uh, if you go on that same paragraph on line number four from bottom of that, uh, line number five from bottom of that paragraph, they say, focusing on the daily market valued risk, though intellectually satisfying for risk managers because the most up-to-date current quantitative measure can be brought to bear on the problem can only be part of the risk management and not that what not the one the top management should focus on so top management has to focus on the longer uh, longer run implications of what of risk as well so here they're basically saying that yes you can use the valued risk to see exactly what is the maximum loss that you're going to be expecting to suffer over a given day as well. But they're basically saying that you must also look at it to see the management uh, now should not only uh, restrict themselves to find out exactly how much is the loss that the organization is expecting to suffer over a given period of, uh, over a given day. They should also now look to see exactly what are the imp financial implications of the maximum loss that we're also expecting to suffer. You look, if you look at the valued risk measure, over a given week, over a given month, or over a given year as well, so that you're able to now to see the overall picture, to see exactly how much losses are we expecting to suffer, and are we able to actually account for these losses or uh, absorb these losses if they what if they materialize as well. Then, if you go to the next part, uh, next page, second paragraph, the same daily value at risk measure assume that assets can be sold quickly or hedged so that a firm can limit its losses essentially within a day. However, both in 1998 and over the last year, we have seen that markets can become suddenly less liquid so that daily valid risk measures lose their meaning. So if a firm sits on the portfolio that can not be traded, a daily valid risk measure is not, uh, is not a measure of the risk of the portfolio because the firm is stuck with the portfolio, uh, with the portfolio for much longer time period as well. So here they're basically saying that when you look at the daily valued risk measure, now basically the assumption here is that if you are saying that uh, you're expecting to suffer so much in losses, the moment you see that those losses have actually materialized up to a certain amount as well, you are basically you are expecting or assuming that when the losses are reach a certain amount, you're assuming that you're going to be able to actually what sell your position and what liquidate, basically if you're not able to liquidate your position then. But what do we know? When the financial crisis hits, there's one of the issues that is usually uh, in the market. That's why you see that um, um, the base accords were uh, adjust. When you look at the amount of capital that banks need to have as well, but the base accords was also ended up out accounting for issue of liquidity when it comes to adjustments of the base accord, in, uh, mainly based on the what 2008 financial crisis, mainly because they also realized that. When it comes to the when the financial crisis happens as well, there's lack of liquidity in the market. And if there's lack of liquidity in the market, it basically means that if you are saying that over a given day, this is how much the maximum loss I'm expected to suffer, it's going to be difficult now to actually liquidate your position if the market is illiquid. Basically, which means that the maximum loss that you're expecting to suffer is going to end up what being exceeded because you're not able to actually what get out of your position because there's no one prepared to actually what taking the to take the counter position on your on on your on your trade as well. Then, so when it comes to risk management failures, it means that you need to be able to know the risk management uh, risk management the six manager risk management failures and how they emanate and be able to discuss and explain the six risk management failures as well so please make sure that you go back to this article and you thoroughly look and understand the six risk management failures that the organization can also can also can also face, uh, face as well so please for, for in case for the exam remember i said when it comes to the exam, you need 1.5 and 1.6. You need to make sure that you know them so that in case they bring them in the exam, one thing that would ask you there in this case in the exam is to be able to discuss 
the six risk management failures, what are they and how are you able to identify these six risk management failures as well? So that you're able to now assert and say, this failure or this loss that the organization suffered, was it because of external factors that the company has not, has not accounted for, or was it purely because of what lack of what risk management as well? Are there any questions when it comes to uh, unit 1.5? Primus? Yes. Uh, so, for an exam, we are not going to be asked uh, how much the firm or the company might have lost due to this uh, risk failure that it has encountered. Or well, you mean like they would ask you, like, for example, to find out to calculate the value at risk? Well, yes, I mean, like, uh, to calculate the value. Uh, that the company might have lost due to the effect of the, the, the failure? For RISK 803, you are not expected to, they would not expect you to calculate the valid risk. You should know that they, 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 there is a risk measure, which is the valid risk, but the actual calculation of the valid risk is, is not relevant for you to do the actual calculation. So, but if you look at, um, market risk, which is RSK 405. That's yeah. when you are going to be now looking to see exactly how do you calculate this valued risk. But for RSK 403, you should not, you just know that there's a risk measure that is used to measure risk, which is basically the valued risk. But the actual calculation itself, you don't have to worry about it. But for market, for RSK 405, that's when you need to know the calculation itself. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Any questions? All right. So we are going to end here today. So this is where we're going to end here today. So which means today we have covered unit 1.1 to 1.5. In the next class, we're going to look at unit 1.6, which looks at the VOCA acronym. Then from there, we're going to look at study unit two, right? So in the next class, we're going to look at 1.6. Then after that, we're going to look at what? Study unit two as well. But remember what I told you, study unit two, it's quite a lot of, uh, um, parts of study unit two. So we're going to look at half of study unit two. Then in the third class, that's when we're going to look at what? The remaining part of study unit two as well. So today we're going to end at unit 1.5. And remember 1.1 to 1.4, go through them so that you know the cases where there was risk management failures, but so that you're able to know it and put it in practice, but don't really dwell too much of your time for the sake of the exam. But you need 1.5. Yes, you need to know you need 1.5. And the main thing that you need to pick from unit 1.5 there is the six types of risk management failures. Because those you are you need to know them so that you're able to identify the risk management failures and um uh, and put them in practice to see exactly so is this failure because of uh, risk management or is it because of other factors other than not uh, uh, risk management failure as well. So please go back, especially unit 1.5. You need to make sure that you fully understand unit 1.5. So far in the previous exams, unit one has never really been asked in detail. I don't remember it being asked in detail, but if it comes, make sure that unit 1.5 and 1.6, you are up to, you are up to, you, you know unit 1.1 and 1, uh, sorry, 1.5 and 1.6, make sure that you know them. Any questions? So if there are no questions, this is where we are going to end today.